Open up your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. Now y'all probably got the King James, New King James, NIV, uh, one of those versions. Today I'm going to be actually reading the New Living Translation. I uh, like the way it said some things in here. It kind of cleared up some things on me. Uh, so y'all can follow through and you can see what I'm talking about where it cleared up some words and phrases. Uh, it's made a little cleaner for us. All right, Galatians chapter 6, I'm going to look at verses 1 through 16. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. For we are each responsible for our own conduct. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Notice what large letters I use as I write these closing words in my own handwriting. Those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want, want to look good to others. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ only can save. And even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. They only want to be circumcised so that they can boast about it, claim you as their disciples. As for me, me, I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified, and the world's interest in me has also died. It doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. If I were to say the phrase, like a good neighbor, I believe most everybody in here could probably complete that sentence from the TV advertisement. So, like a good neighbor, everybody knows that. How many ads do we watch and it gets stuck in our mind, but everybody can remember something like that. You see, advertisers, they figured out long ago that people want to hear that Whatever you've got, you're there for them. For the insurance company, they want you to know that they're there in, the, in times of hardships, uh, wrecks, death, uh, house burning down. They want you to know that they're there to take care of you and to help you through those difficult times. And it doesn't have to be insurance. It can also be other advertisements. They want you to know that maybe uh, some, some restaurants or some people say, when you're here, you're like, Family, family. You see, they want to know, they want you to know and, and feel comfortable that you are there for them. Uh, but when we look at what God says, God says that we should take care of our neighbors. And then what does the devil say? The devil says that we should isolate ourselves from everyone. God says, take care of your neighbors. The devil says, no, don't even talk to your neighbors. God says that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. And the devil says that we should live in conflict with our neighbors. God says that we should help our neighbor that might be caught in sin and, and help to lift them up and to restore them back to their faith in Jesus Christ. And to do that with gentleness and humbleness. The devil says that if somebody's caught up in sin, we should condemn, condemn them and then have nothing to do with them. When I think about how we should relate and how we should forgive and love and all that, 
I can't help but think of the story of Jesus and how he treated the woman that was called in adultery. All the Pharisees brought the woman in. You got to ask yourself, why didn't they bring the man? The man was committing adultery as well. But they only brought the woman and they threw her down at the feet of Jesus. And they were wanting to stone her to death for committing such an act. But Jesus put the Pharisees in their place and he said, okay, that he is without sin cast the first stone. And when they thought about that, they all walked away because everybody's a sinner. Everybody in this room today is a sinner. We, we, we're all still caught up in sin. Uh, God's working on us, trying to help us to overcome all that. But we still, you know, even the pastor, like I said on Fridays, you know, I was breaking the law, I was speeding in the rain on top of that. So, you know, we're, we all have our faults. We all have things that we're doing wrong. But as much as the God wants us to, to forgive each other and to help restore each other, the devil says, condemn, destroy, kill, get rid of. But Jesus, he loved that woman so much that he lifted her up and said, where are your accusers? She said, no one. He said, well, neither do I. But he didn't leave her in her sin. He said, go and sin no more. Get on the right path. Let me work in your life. Let my spirit dwell inside of you. Let me help you to rid yourself of sin. Look back at verses one through five of our scripture in Galatians. Dear brothers and sisters, if, any, if, any, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you, will need to, you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. The Bible says that we should share in each other's burdens. We should, we should help somebody out when they're in need. But you know what? When I, when I think about our world today, sometimes I, I think we might be like in, in caught up in a strange movie where maybe everybody's fleeing from a building and they're trying to get out the doors and, and you got this mass amount of people running and somebody falls down and, and everybody just tramples all over them and they don't care about them. And they kill the person in the process. Sometimes that's what our world feels like. Don't worry about your neighbor. Just get out. Just run over them. Get away so that you're safe. Don't be concerned about your neighbor at all. Sometimes we just soon step on our neighbor and crush them than to bend down and help them back up. And that's tough. For the Christian, it's the exact opposite. We need, we need to do something totally different than what the world is doing. Instead of doing something to harm our neighbor, we need to, or, or being concerned about our health while, while we're trying to get away or, or our circumstances or whatever it is, we should be there to maybe put ourselves in harm's way for our neighbor. When I think about that, you know, I think about the, the Secret Service agents. They, they made a commitment. They're, they're going to protect the president at all costs. They, They've signed on that if somebody starts shooting at the president, that they'll jump in front of the president and they'll sacrifice their own life just to save the president. Why do they do that? Well, the president is an important person. But if you think back to what I said last week, who's important in this world? In this world, the, the janitor is just as important as the CEO. Every person has value in this world. And sometimes we look at a person in their circumstances and we think they have no value. They're useless and worthless in our society. But even the worst of the worst I've seen get transformed by God to be the best of the best. A lot of your preachers that are out here preaching the word of God, they've been in the gutter. They know what filth and sin looks like, but God saved them and turned them around and lifted them up. And now they're the best of the best. 
They're the ones that are leading the cause. And when you, I think about my own life, I know where I came from and I know where God has taken me. And I can tell you, God can do an amazing thing with a person. Everybody has value. It doesn't matter what they're going through in life. But you see, it's how we react to people when they're in those situations. It's what we do when they're down and out. Do we continue to step on them or do we lift them up out of the gutter and, and help them to find the right path? Maybe sometimes it might even be a Christian brother or sister that is struggling. Do we do our very best to help them up or are the words only coming out of our mouth to condemn them for all that they are not doing? We need to make sure that we love our neighbor. You see, that's all part of the love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. That's the two greatest commandments. You see, God tells us to love our neighbor, to, to care more about them than we do even our own selves. But sometimes we get caught up like the world and we just as soon trample them into the ground. And I can tell you, God cannot change the world if we don't love God and love our neighbor. It doesn't work that way. This is the only way that we're ever going to change our world is by loving people back to the Lord. Let's look at verses 6 through 10. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers sharing all good things with them. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. You know, as people that live out in the country, we all know about farming. Uh, we, we talk about it often here. Uh, we took, we're thankful that God sends the rain to, to make the crops grow. But as people that live out in the country, we know about farming. And we know that if you go out and you plant corn, you know at harvest time you're going to have corn to, to reap. If you plant beans or potatoes or whatever it is you plant, you're going to get what you plant. You don't put corn in the ground and expect strawberries to come up. You know you're going to get what you plant. And it's the same for us in our life. If we plant sin in our life, we're going to find destruction, decay, devastation. But if we plant the spiritual things in our life, we're going to find blessings. We're going to find God's blessings falling on our life. We're gonna, he's going to give us the things that we need because we're loving God and, and, and loving our neighbor. You see, if we're, if, we got, if we're living by the Spirit, then we're going to do good things. If we're hanging around good people, we're going to do good things. If we're hanging around bad people, we're probably going to do bad things. Now, by that statement, I don't mean that we shun bad people. I mean, we help them up out of their circumstances. But if you're hanging around bad people doing bad things, the Bible says be careful lest you fall into the same temptation. We could be doing the same things. So don't think too highly of yourself. We want to make sure that we're uh, doing good, godly things and things that honor God. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus tells us uh, that we will be known by our fruit. And I talked about that last week as well. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. You see, if you've got the Spirit of God living in you, you're going to have these things. If God planted His Spirit in your heart, you're going to return the fruit of the Spirit. It's only logical to, to think that way. If we live by the Spirit, we're going to do good things. If we don't live by the Spirit, we're going to do bad things. God gives us the opportunity every day to do good things. 
to bring him glory, honor, and praise. Good things to help bring somebody up out of the gutter. Good things that will help bring honor to God, to change our world, to change our neighborhoods. You see, when we live by the Spirit, God knows our hearts. He knows our hearts better than anybody else. He knows the way we act, what we say, what we do, how we think. He knows all of that about us and even more. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. You see, God knows more about us than we do. God knows what you're thinking today. He knows what you're going to think about tomorrow. He knows what you're going to say to somebody tomorrow. He knows the opportunity that he's going to give you to do something for his glory and honor. Are you willing to take him at his word that he's going to be there with you and, and he's going to help you to do those things? God knows us greater than anybody. Do we really know ourselves? Let's look at our last scripture, verse 11 through 16. Notice what large letters I use as I write these closing words in my own handwriting. Those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good to others. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. And even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. They only want you to be circumcised so that they can boast about it and claim you as their disciple. As for me, may I never boast in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified and the world's interest in me has also died. It doesn't matter whether we've been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we've been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. You see, Paul is ending the discussion that he's been having all through the book of Galatians on the circumcision issue. He's telling those that wish to follow the Jews and, and follow this ritual that they're going to be held to the full extent of the law. And Paul is also saying that none of the Jews... Not one Jew has ever held the law except the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Every one of them falls short. So the circumcision is useless. It's not going to get you to God. That's what he's trying to tell the people. The only way that you're going to get to God is the way of the cross. By the death of our Lord Jesus Christ on that cross, we have been made new. We are new people. You see, Jesus exchanged. It is the biggest exchange in all the history of the world. He took all of our rottenness and he gave us his goodness. I've been watching this car show. They're always talking about trading up. They build this car so that they can trade up to get to the next bill. So that they can trade up and then finally get that big payday. I can tell you there's never been any bigger payday than what Jesus had gave us because he took all of our dirt and filth and lies and everything bad about us and he exchanged it for everything good about himself. No greater exchange has ever taken place in the history of the world. And when we have faith, when we live by that faith and principle, then God makes us into a new creation. He creates a new person out of the old. We get a new name. We get to be called the redeemed of God. And God's spirit lives in us and helps us to change our lives for his glory and honor. So I'm asking you, what have you done with yourself since becoming a new creation? Does it look a whole lot like the old creation? Do people see something different in the way you live and how you speak? How do you treat your neighbor? And I'm not necessarily talking about the person that lives next door to you. Your neighbor could be 100 miles away, 1,000 miles away, 10,000 miles away. How do we treat people? Like I started out in my sermon, 
like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Maybe we change that around. Maybe we do a good neighbor like Jesus said. Like a good neighbor, lead someone to Christ. Lead someone to Christ. And you do that in your actions and in your speech and your friendships with them and how they see you treat them when they're down and out. I can tell you, looking back on my life, Jeff Bibbert saw a man struggling and he didn't care. He said, I'm going to love this guy. I'm going to take him in and I'm going to lead him to the Lord because I know God's got good things for him to do. God can do the same thing for you that he's done for me. He can take you to levels that you never thought you'd ever stand on. He can take you to places that you never thought you'd ever step foot in. And he can give you love for people that you never thought you'd ever love in your life. That's what God's glory is all about. Allowing the spirit to show the world the fruit of God living in your heart. So how do we care about our neighbor? Do we sit back and watch him go to hell and not do anything? Or do we share Christ with them? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. Thank you for your word today. We thank you how your spirit can touch our hearts and light it on fire for you. God, I know that sometimes that flame seems so dim. And we seem so fearful of the things that are going on in our world. But God, give us courage to stand in your spirit that we might accomplish what you want to do with us. Father, help us to stand strong in a world that's seemingly falling apart. We know that it's all for your purpose and your honor and your glory. So help us to see the end picture the goal, the prize, heaven, and our eternity with you. Father, if we're falling short or we're on the wrong path, I pray that you lead us back. If we see somebody falling down, let's pick them up. Let's love them back to the Lord. Father, we need your help to do that. We're asking for that in Jesus' name. Amen.